This video is going to be a more extended look at Nuke's new Boca node, as well as showing how it can use deep data. This is what we're going to be working with in this video. This should look fairly familiar apart from this node off to the side. So we have our beauty render here, we have a kernel off to the side, the Boca node here, and then we have the 3D camera used to render the scene, and then the deep read node which I'll talk about more once we get into the video. The last video was just an overview of the basic settings in this node and how to get it working. But there's a lot more to this node than I showed in the last video, so we're going to take a look at some of these other tabs that have some other settings, as well as talking about setting it up to use Deep. Unless you've studied visual effects at university or you actually work in a VFX studio, you're probably not going to be familiar with what Deep actually is. It's not a term you normally come across unless you're working on something pretty high-end, and it's certainly not something I'd ever been aware of before I started working at a VFX studio. So to give a basic summary of it, this is the render that I used from the last video, and if I look at the depth channel, you can see that this is basically what we were using last time to generate the depth. This is a gradient that's going all the way through the scene, and you can include this as a pass with your 3D renders. And the idea with this is that there is a colour value for every depth in the shot. So for example, if I sample the colour here, I can see that the value of the face of the character is 4.8, and then I can also sample the value of the windshield, and I can see it's 4.4. And what you can do with this information is plug it into a node like Boca or the ZD Focus node like I showed in the last video. And it will allow you to basically create a 3D defocus effect. This should be fairly accurate because Nuke has the data of where everything is in the shot. However, this approach, even though it's come from 3D renders, is actually still being done in 2D as you're using a 2D layer, which is the depth pass in compositing, to do the defocusing. Like I showed in the last video, this workflow isn't absolutely perfect, so you can quite often get defocusing issues on the edges of objects, Sometimes the depth pass won't be exactly accurate to where something should be in 3D space. Just to demonstrate that again very quickly. Here I've done a really heavy defocus using the depth pass from the render, and I've pushed it really far. And as you can see, all around the edges of the render where it's being defocused, we're getting some issues where the defocus isn't responding properly at the edge of the car. However, what's different about Deep is that every pixel has actual 3D depth information. To make use of it in Nuke, Deep actually has its own completely separate set of nodes to the normal ones you would use. So for example here I've just read in a normal CG render using a read node. However to bring in a render that has deep data, you have to use a node called a deep read instead. And if I search for deep you can see that there's lots of different nodes. We have a deep color correct, deep crop, deep expression, deep from frames, deep from image, the list goes on. So to bring in the render I'm going to add a deep read. And then it works exactly the same as a normal read node. So you're going to navigate to where the render is on your hard drive and then bring this in. Then if I look at this render and I go to the channels up here and look at the deep channel, this is essentially the 3D depth information that we're going to be using in the Boca node. It's quite difficult to see, but if I turn my viewport gamma and gain all the way down, you can just start to make out the subject in the shot here. And again, just like the depth pass from Blender, you can see that all of these pixels have a very slightly different color value, which corresponds to their depth in 3D space. Where this deep pass differs from a normal depth pass is when you start to use the other deep nodes. So if I go back to looking at RGBA, reset my viewer, I'm going to add another node called deep to points. Then if I plug in the deep render into the deep input, and I plug in my render camera into the camera input, and look at this node, and then go into the 3D view, you can see that this generates a point cloud for the entire shot, which is really amazing. This is probably the best way of demonstrating how all the pixels actually have their own 3D depth data. If I just change these settings a little bit, we can make the points even bigger, so it'll be a bit clearer. There's a load of really cool things you can do when working in Deep, and it's too much to go into in one video. Just to gloss over a few, for example, some of the projects that I've worked on previously that have utilized Deep, you can do things like placing 3D cards with Roto at somewhere in the middle of the render. So for example, if I add a card in here, let's just make this much bigger. And let's say I wanted to put some Roto in between the character and the back wall. This isn't something you'd normally be able to do with a standard 3D render, but because the pixels all have their own depth data, it actually gives you loads more control when working with things at different depths in the shot for compositing different elements. For example, this is a trailer for Battlefield 2042. I worked on this a couple of years ago when I was working at the mill, and this is one of the shots that I comped. It ended up being really tricky, and we decided to use Deep for it in the end, because basically what's happening is there's this massive crash zoom that goes all the way into the person, and then at the end of the zoom the focus racks from the scope on the gun all the way back to his face. And the problem with this is that the ghillie suit has a load of really fine edges because it's basically loads of bits of hair. And I was trying to do it just with a 2D depth pass and it just wasn't working. Because it's such a shallow depth of field there were loads of artifacts on the edge of the gun and on the edge of the hair. And so what we ended up doing for this shot was actually using Boker before it was integrated into Nuke. So we decided to go down the route of rendering this shot in deep. And that gave me complete control and compositing over where the focus was. And I was able to animate the focus pool using the deep data. 
it gives pretty much the same result as actually baking the depth of field and the focus pool into the 3D render, which obviously will then work properly and you won't have any artifacts, but it also locks you in and gives you no control in compositing because the depth of field is already in the render. So what you might be thinking after hearing that is, well, if it's so much better, then why don't we just use deep for everything? One of the reasons is that not all render engines currently support outputting deep data. So for example, I use Blender predominantly in my spare time, and none of the render engines in Blender like Cycles or EV have the option to output the deep pass. So that functionality currently doesn't exist. But the main one is just that deep is extremely heavy. If I compare the file sizes between these two, this is just a normal render without any deep data. The shot is a 60 frame image sequence, and this standard render with a few extra passes is 487 megabytes. If I look at the deep data to compare it, for the same resolution and the same number of frames and everything, this render is three and a half gigabytes. So in this case, the file sizes are about six times larger. And that's gonna have a really big knock-on effect when it comes to using the renders for compositing. It's a lot more data to read and write from the hard drive, so that's gonna make things slower. And also because Deep is far more accurate, that also comes with much more computational time. It's basically impossible to play it back in real time and rendering comps with it take absolutely ages as well. For context, the machines that I use at work have CPUs and GPUs that cost more than most people's cars, and they have over 200 gigabytes of RAM. And even on a machine like that, you still can't play it back in real time. It's very much like a pre-comp it and then render it at the end kind of situation. So to show you what it actually looks like, this is the Boca node with it all plugged in. That displays instantly because I cached it earlier before this tutorial, so it's already got that frame loaded. But if I change one of the settings, let's set the front multiplier to nine instead. And as you can probably see almost immediately, this is why deep doesn't get used for every single shot. But once it eventually is finished, this is the output. If I zoom in really close and look at the edges of the render, you'll hopefully notice a very distinct lack of artifacts on the edge between the part of the render that's sharp, where the focal plane is set, and the background that is now currently out of focus. So as you can see, deep essentially gives you perfect defocusing in post. It's very costly in terms of time and the space it takes up on the hard drive. If you have a shot that really needs this kind of precision, then deep is basically the way to go. And the Boca node is the only tool in Nuke that can utilize deep. The traditional ZD focus doesn't actually have any ability to use it. It can only use depth passes. So that's the overview of how it works. Now let's actually go into setting it up. So let's unplug this one and put it over here. And I'm gonna start from scratch by just adding a new Boca node. The input goes into your RGB render. And then the deep input on the left is the one that you plug into your deep read. Now, if I look at the Boca node, we can start to change some of the settings. The first thing I'm gonna do is look at the deep node and just go to the deep pass and actually look at where I want to put the focus. So I'm gonna sample an area on the front of the character's face, which is about here, so 344. And then what you wanna do is put that number into your focal plane in the bokeh node. And then we go back to looking at RGBA and actually look at the bokeh node. Our focus will now be set there. So if I turn up the multiply to something like 30, once it eventually loads, there's now a very, very thin slice of the subject that's now in focus. And you can sort of see that by this sharp line that's appearing. You can see what's going on a bit better if you change the output type from defocused image to focal distance visualization. And if you've done any defocusing with 3D nodes before, this should be fairly familiar to you. Turning up the focus region size will increase the size of the red line and how far back and close to the camera it goes into the scene. So for example, if I set this to something like 61, this red section is now the part that's perfectly in focus. And if I go back to defocused image, the depth of field is now a lot less shallow. What I've currently done there is just turned up the multiplier, which will basically do like a global lift and increase or decrease on the depth of field. What you can also do is use the front and back multipliers independently. Turning up the front multiplier will affect the depth of field on stuff closer to the camera, and the back multiplier is stuff that's further away from the camera, on the other side of the focal region that we set. So I set the back multiplier on its own to something like 50. Oh, that might be really heavy actually. Let's do 15. <laughs> and as you can see now, the background is super, super out of focus, but the stuff in the foreground has remained really sharp. From a purely technical perspective, there's no way this would work in real life. You'd never have such shallow depth of field like this, where something this close to the camera would be sharp, and then the background would be this soft. It's kind of like all or nothing. If it was this shallow, then this would be super out of focus as well. But the nice thing about having the front and back multipliers independently is you have a lot more creative control over the depth of field than you would if you were just filming this for real with a camera. And you'll also notice that even with a really, really crazy depth of field on the background, we still have perfectly sharp edges on the subject, which is really cool, again, because we're using the deep data. So if I was going for something a little bit more realistic, I'd probably set this to about eight and maybe the front multiplier to three, just to get the front a little bit soft, maybe even a little bit higher on the back. Let's go for 11, possibly even a bit more on the front. This looks a bit too sharp to me still. So let's turn this up to like six or seven. Yeah, that looks better, cool. Now we wait. Cool, there we go. So I think that's looking pretty nice now. So this is gonna be the base settings for the first tab. 
Now I'm gonna start going into some of the settings in the other tabs that I didn't show in the last video. The second tab along the top is the lens tab, and this is where you can put in some more information about your camera. In this case, this is obviously a fully 3D shot, and so this wasn't filmed with a real camera. But if you were integrating some CG into a live action shot, you could actually put in the camera details here. So your film format is actually the size of your sensor and the focal length and aperture and everything is obviously to do with your lens. Over here, I actually have the 3D camera that was used to render this shot. So if I go into the projection tab, I have all of the lens information and everything here. So I can see that this was a 21 millimeter lens. It's got a load of decimals, but I'm not gonna bother doing that. I'm just gonna put 21. The aperture number is the camera's f-stop. So again, this will correspond to the f-stop that the lens has. If you wanted to mimic a super shallow depth of field, you could set this to something lower, like for example, a prime lens might have an aperture of 1.8. And then down here, another one that might make a difference is the format. And this is the size of your camera sensor or if you're filming on film, obviously it's just the size of the film. This can make quite a big difference as well. For example, filming on an APS-C sensor compared to a full frame sensor like a Sony A7 series camera will make a difference to the way the depth of field looks. To actually take these settings into account, you have to turn on real world lens simulation. And then as you can see, it's gonna completely change the look. So I can drop my aperture down to like one, maybe even lower, maybe 0.8. And then the render will start to behave in the same way that changing these settings on a real camera would. I'm actually gonna drop this even lower just so we get that really nice shallow depth of field back that we had before. You will also notice that if you turn on real world lens simulation, if I come back to the bokeh tab, it will actually gray out a couple of settings here. So the multiplier and the focus region fall off will actually be turned off. That's because those settings are now being controlled essentially by this tab. That's it for the lens settings. Let's go on to the optical artifacts tab. In here we have some settings for mimicking the way that light goes through a lens and will refract and bloom. To demonstrate how these work, it's probably gonna be a bit easier to see if everything's out of focus. So I'm just gonna set the focal plane to be much closer to the camera. So the first one is bloom. If I turn this on, you'll be able to see what it does pretty quickly. So that's after, and this is before. It's pretty subtle, but it's basically just changing the way that the bokeh interacts with highlights. So when stuff that's really bright, like the pings on the metal in this shot get defocused, the highlights that then become this bokeh start to get this blooming effect on top of just being defocused, which is really nice. It's just a little bit more truthful to what would actually happen in real life. The bloom threshold is basically a slider for how bright something has to be in the shot before it starts to bloom. So this is if I set it to a much lower value, this is before and after. Then we have spherical and chromic aberration. To briefly explain these two and the difference between them, chromatic or chromic aberration is caused by lens dispersion with different colors of light traveling at different speeds while passing through a lens. And the result of this is the fairly well-known effect where you get some color fringing on the edges of objects, especially on the highlights. Typically you'll see this as like a red and blue shift or green and magenta. On the other hand, spherical aberration is where light through the center of the lens focuses at a different point than light at the edge of the lens. The effect of this is it will create some contrast in the bokeh between the edge and the very center. With the bokeh node specifically, a lower value below zero for the spherical aberration will create a center of the bokeh that is brighter, and a higher value above zero will create a brighter edge, which will appear as a ring. There's also specific color controls for the chromic aberration offset. Changing these is gonna affect the color of the chromatic aberration. So for example, I could do like 2.5, two for the blue as well. And it's kind of changing the weighting. So you can see there's a lot more red and blue now present, whereas previously it was a lot more green and purple. I'm gonna leave this on, but I'm gonna set it to a really small number. I want it to be barely visible, but just giving a little bit of that effect. I think about 0.8 looks nice. So that's after, this is before. You can kind of see it mostly on this bit of bokeh here. Just a little bit of fringing on the very edges. The next tab is the kernel input, which I showed in the last video. Again, changing the kernel type from circular to input will actually allow you to plug in a kernel and use it, like the one I have here. So this is with the kernel plugged in. You can see it's adopting the shape of this one that I've given it, and I think that looks a lot nicer. Alternatively, what you can do is change it to aperture blades, and then these sliders down here go some of the way to basically allowing you to make your own kernel. I zoom in on one of the highlights up here. You can see that the blade count is currently set to six, and now all of the bokeh in the shot has taken on a hexagonal shape. I can change this to something higher or lower, so four, for example. Now it's basically a square. I think most high-end lenses tend to have about nine aperture blades, so let's set it to nine. You can change the rotation if you so desired. Let's just set this a little bit lower so it's a bit clearer what's going on. We've got a pentagon now. Turning up the curvature will kind of round off the edges of the blades. So you can see as I turn this up closer to one, it becomes pretty circular. Whereas if it's on zero, it'll be very, very sharp edges. Increasing the softness pretty much just kind of blurs the bokeh. And then changing the aspect ratio would allow you to get an anamorphic look if you wanted, so you get that kind of squished bokeh. Anamorphic bokeh always looks really nice. The same for the other direction. It's a bit less common to have it going horizontally, but it does happen. It all really just depends on the lens. 
so that's all the different settings for the look of the bokeh. I'm just going to go back to kernel because I think it looks the nicest. And then the last tab is more of just a technical thing, but this is the corrective slices. You can kind of think of this as like a quality slider for the entire bokeh node. The more corrective slices you have in a shot, the more accurate the defocusing is going to be. The current setting is 10 and I've never really found that I've had to change it before, but if you set this to something lower, you might find it makes the node a bit better optimized because it's doing a bit less calculations, but the quality of the defocusing might actually be a bit worse. In this case, it's a terrible example because the focal point isn't in the shot, so everything's kind of a similar level of defocus. So if I set the focal plane back to actually be on the character's face, where you're really going to notice the difference is the fall off between the bits of the image that are in focus and the bits that are out of focus. So again, this is with just one corrective slice. Now I set it back to 10. This is the difference. Where I noticed it the most was this kind of mohawk thing going along the top of the character's helmet. And you can kind of see it all the way along most of the edges of the subject as it's falling off into the different focal planes. One, 10. One, 10. Quite a big difference. So there we go. That's a much more detailed look into a lot of the settings in Nuke's new Boca node, as well as looking at how it can use deep data for very accurate defocusing.